Shashitaro, thanks for joining me on Upfront. Pleasure to be with you, Mary. The subtitle to your best-selling book, The Elephant, The Tiger and the Cell Phone, is Reflections on India, the Emerging 21st Century Power. Can a country in which almost half the population still struggles to make ends meet, lacks access to basic services, the world's largest illiterate population is there. Can such a country really be described as a 21st century power? No, it can't. And that was a subtitle of the American edition. I objected <laughs> after I saw it, but it was too late. In fact, one of my notorious comments after that is, how can we be a superpower when we're still super poor? We have enormous challenges. The Indian subtitle was somewhat more innocuous. Uh, I will say, however, that the country has tremendous potential. Well, on the political level, in your books, in your writings, uh, in your public speaking, you speak a great deal about India being a democracy, about being a thriving, uh, pluralist, liberal democracy. But what do you say to someone like Arundhati Roy, the famous Indian novelist, who argues that India is actually moving away from democracy and actually towards a form of fascism, a form even of totalitarianism, that she says your country's been taken over by uh, nationalist elites, corporatist elites? Well, the very fact that she can say all this and say it in India suggests that she couldn't entirely be right. The fact is that there are forces in our country who are illiberal and we need to resist them. And there are people like me who do. I think denouncing the entire system is actually not a useful way of tackling these problems. Within the system, there's a tremendous, lively, positive debate. And we can stoutly oppose the illiberal tendencies without saying the entire system is bad, it isn't. You've, you're the chairman of the Indian Parliament's Foreign Affairs Committee, yeah. uh, a former Minister of State for Foreign Affairs. Uh, yet you've said in the past that you don't want to criticise your government's foreign policy. You've said, even though you're a member of the Congress Party of the Opposition, uh, you've said that for you, politics stops at the water's edge. Does that apply even when your government is headed by a leader, BJP Prime Minister Narendra Modi, who many believe was involved in crimes against humanity in Gujarat when 2,000 Muslims were massacred on his watch? Well, I was one of those whose voices were raised against Mr Modi for many years. But it is true, number one, that he hasn't been convicted by any court, hasn't been found guilty even by association yet, uh, and therefore we can't really speak of him as being culpable. And second, that he has won an enormous mandate from the Indian electorate. And that in every democracy is a kind of absolution as well. So I'd rather focus on Mr. Modi, the Prime Minister, what he's doing today, what he could do tomorrow, rather than worry about the past. It is a blot. But if you're the victims held against of a massacre him. in Gujarat, that's not the past for you. You I want accountability, you, you want I, justice. I agree you say he really. hasn't been tried. Are you someone who thinks he should be tried? The Supreme Court's amicus curiae said there was a case for him to answer in court. Others disagreed, of course. That's right. And the point is that ultimately the judiciary decides who's going to be uh, consider so you have no view on culpable. It. Well, no, I mean, I, I, I haven't done as much, obviously, to look into it as the investigative team, the amicus curiae, the lawyers on both sides, and they both made very compelling arguments. To my mind, the fact is they were victims. The victims suffered horrendously. And for us to be indifferent to their plight is impossible. The question is who's responsible, and we have to wait for the judicial system to There's establish There's been that. a discussion uh, in India, especially since the last election last year when Mr. Modi won his big victory, about the rise of so-called Hindu nationalism, Hindutva, about communal rhetoric. Uh, recently, a Muslim man in the state of Uttar Pradesh was murdered. He was lynched uh, by a Hindu nationalist mob for allegedly eating or keeping beef in his house. Uh, some would say that the Congress Party hasn't spoken up loudly enough, vocally enough, People like yourself who are the secular liberals, where are your voices in this debate when the country is supposedly heading in this reactionary direction? It so happens that Parliament is not in session, so we couldn't use that forum, which we would have, but we've all spoken in the public space, to the press, on television, on Twitter, in my case, and social media. Uh, so we've made our voices heard. There's no doubt about that. Rahul Gandhi, the, the vice president the of the party, has been to the family home, met the family. And yet the Congress party is saying now is the time we should support the BJP government and have a ban on beef. That sounds like you're pandering rather than challenging. No, I mean, I, I must say that was a statement by one Congress leader. Uh, we haven't got to that point yet. But the, my Is that argument... something you support? No. My argument has throughout been that what you or I choose to eat is an intimate personal decision, and it's nobody else's business what we do. I happen to be vegetarian, but I have absolutely no problem with anybody in my but, home but this consuming is not, anything they want. And this is a particular example, but there are many, many other examples that NGOs and human rights groups have raised. Are you worried? See, the criticism seems to be of you is that you're someone who's come from the UN, you're someone who styles yourself as a liberal, as a secularist. Why aren't you angry? Why aren't you passionately leading campaigns? India is heading in a dangerous direction, as many would say. 
Do you think it's heading in a dangerous I, I direction? I do, and read me, Mehdi, and you'll see that you know, each of us has our own strengths. Some are better off doing this on the street. Some of, some of us are better off doing it uh, in the written uh, space and on television. I've been doing precisely those But you've also got in trouble on the written space yeah. in that you praised Narendra Modi's cleanup campaign last year. You lost your job as a Congress Party spokesman for praising the Prime Minister. Mm -hmm. You tweeted happy birthday to Mr Modi. You said you admire the fact that he leaves positive impressions wherever he goes. Many say, well, why are you cozying up to this man if he's so dangerous? He may be responsible for bloodshed. All right, let's take those one by one. The Clean India campaign, when the Prime Minister of your country invites you to associate with him in a non-political enterprise, it would seem churlish at the very least to say no. And nobody else did. He invited everyone from Sachin Tendulkar to the movie actor Salman Khan and Priyanka Chopra, and, and I was one of those nine. Are you holding your political standards to standards of Bollywood stars? Is it's that not, really your standard? No, that's not the point. The point is, here is an objective, a clean India, that goes back to the days of Mahatma Gandhi. The first sanitation campaign in India was but led the by the Congress Party government. impression suggests that you're not as anti him as you should be, if you believe that he's a dangerous figure. If that's what you believe. It doesn't seem to be the case I in have your said, I have said interaction. When the Prime Minister says the right thing, I will acknowledge it. But you are worried to take the bigger point about the direction India is going in. You're not someone who's complacent about where India is going. Not at all complacent. BJ. I believe there is rising intolerance. I believe the Prime Minister, through his silence, has condoned some outrageous statements and ideas by his ministers, in some cases, by political party leaders <coughs> of his party. And I believe that he... While he himself has so far not said the wrong thing, his silence too is tantamount to not saying the right thing. And that's something that, as a prime minister, he can be held accountable. He invited you to join a clean-up campaign and you said it would be churlish to refuse. If he invited you to join his government, would you accept? Well, he wouldn't and I wouldn't accept. Never. You rule out ever well, look, serving in a BJP or Modi-led government. We have a parliamentary system. And in our system, as in the British system, but perhaps not in the American one, where I do know that they've been cabinet members from other parties. In our system, you belong to a parliamentary majority or to a parliamentary opposition. I'm in the parliamentary well, opposition. Let's talk about your parliamentary opposition. You're a Congress Party politician. We spoke about the BJP's uh, record in Gujarat. You talked about the Prime Minister's silence. It's not as if Congress governments were immune from ethnic or sectarian or communal violence. Plenty well, of riots under Congress chief ministers, Congress government. There have been riots, unfortunately, throughout um, in every part of India under every sort of government, but there's one big difference. The Congress Party has never been accused of inciting one or seeking to profit from That's one. That's not true. In the, in the no, 1980s, absolutely. Congress Party politicians the, led pogroms against Sikhs the Sikh, after the assassination after of Indira Gandhi. You that know that, is, that and I know that. That is the one exception that I personally condemned That's at the time. That's a big exception. It is. But what we're talking about with the BJP, as I have, I have publicly stated, is that there are elements in the BJP who are deliberately inciting communal violence in order to benefit from the political polarization that they hope will ensue. In other words, that it's a way of rallying majority Hindu opinion behind them or enough of it to win elections. And to our mind, that is absolutely unforgivable. You attract a lot of attention as an Indian politician. Uh, the media is obsessed with your every move. The only Indian politician uh, at one stage, I think the Prime Minister was behind you in the number of Twitter followers. You have several million followers on oh, Twitter. You overtook me in 2013. You, you overtook, so. well, you're, you're obviously keeping a close eye on it. Why do you think you attract so much attention from the press and the public in India? Look, I have absolutely no idea. I, in Twitter, I was frankly one of the early adopters. And as a result, uh, because I was tweeting at a time when our media didn't particularly welcome anybody bypassing them and going directly to the public, I guess I got a fair amount of unwelcome uh, attention for my tweets. Subsequently, the media themselves have seen Twitter as a source they can mine. And they themselves, the major media figures in India, are on, on social media as well. So the atmosphere has changed. And Mr. Modi certainly has been using it extensively and quite effectively. Why I get attention, you folks who give me the attention will have to explain it. Well, some would say that Twitter uh, has helped you in terms of building your profile, um, but it's also hurt you as well. Uh, your late wife, Sunanda Pushka, took to Twitter to publicly suggest once that you were having an affair with a Pakistani journalist. And suddenly, everyone in India is looking at your Twitter account and following all of your private life via Twitter. Well, I think I was being followed before that happened. But that was a pretty case. big moment. That, that, that was a very sad moment. My wife was not a well woman, and indeed she passed away within a few days of, 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 of all of that. So it was a painful episode, and I'm not sure it's typical of anything else. Uh, either in my life or, or, or in that and particular a, experience. And I'm sure it must have been a very painful episode. Uh, she was initially thought to be suicide. And then in January of this year, 
the Delhi police deemed it to be a murder case, which I can't imagine what that must have been like for you in terms of pretty awful stressfulness. Think. Indeed, you're a ex diplomat at the UN, you're an ex-minister, you're a best-selling author, and yet today, these days, most of the focus on you centers on what may or may not have happened to your late wife. Well, what the police like? are still trying to establish whether it was a murder. I think technically that's, that's what the investigation is trying to do right now. Obviously, everybody in the family would be very concerned, even though none of us believes. And when I say none of us, I include her brothers and her son, uh, who are the, the immediate family members other than, my, other than myself. And none of us believes that this, this could possibly have been that. We knew she was not well. She'd been seeing multiple doctors. But if there is a basis for making such an inquiry, uh, we've been waiting almost two years for that inquiry to come to a definitive conclusion. And so far, there hasn't been one. And you're a newcomer to the kind of rough world of Indian politics. You have, you're not a lifelong Indian politician. You uh, come from, from the it. UN. Yeah. I mean, in India, after this happens, one of your political rivals suggests that you know who the murderer of your wife is. Another goes on TV and says you murdered your wife. The police say that you're not a suspect in the case. How do you deal with accusations like that? Well, there's a tremendous amount of irresponsibility around the media. And, uh, you know, either one has the option of suing these people or of ignoring them and unbalance the old adage that, you know, there's no point wrestling in a mud pit with a pig because, you know, you get down to the pig's level, the pig enjoys being in the mud, you and you just get... come out getting dirty. I don't believe anyone would have any reason to murder my wife. I don't believe there was a murder. But as long as the possibility of one is being you investigated... You must want to know if there is someone exactly, out there. If, well, uh, you know, it's impossible, but if there was one... I'm you sure think the... it's impossible? You don't accept even... Well, I mean, uh, you know, no one has given a convincing reason for believing... So why are the police doing this? Because, unfortunately, there... there was a, 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 a forensic report that speculated about poisoning without any evidence explaining why that speculation was offered. Largely because if there had been any evidence, it would have emerged by now and we would have seen some progress in this matter. It's a rather protracted investigation. We're waiting for it to conclude. And really, I don't have much to say until that happens. OK, we'll have to leave it there. Shashi Thank you very much for joining me on Upfront. Thank you.